Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Oshman Family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Oshman Family JCC is an incubator for new expressions of Jewish identity. It creates innovative Jewish learning, celebrations, and arts programs that inspire personal connections to people and ideas from across the Jewish world. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is a special bonus episode of Judaism Unbound, the Hebrew Hammer versus Hitler. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rofberg. And we are really excited to be here today with the filmmakers behind the cult classic, The Hebrew Hammer, and hopefully it's soon to be sequel, The Hebrew Hammer vs. Hitler. Our guests today are Jonathan Kesselman, the writer and director of The Hebrew Hammer, and Adam Goldberg, the star of the movie and The Hebrew Hammer himself. You know, just as we're working on these episodes featuring regular Jews, i.e. non-Jewish professionals who are doing interesting Jewish projects, we are starting to find out about a number of projects that are actually quite timely because because they are raising money through resources like Kickstarter, or in this case, Indiegogo. As we'll talk about later in the interview, Jonathan and Adam are looking to get the movie funded, in part at least, through crowdfunding approaches such as Indiegogo. Just a little more introduction. Our guests today are Jonathan Kesselman. He is the writer and director of The Hebrew Hammer and hopefully The Hebrew Hammer versus Hitler. He is an award-winning film director whose second film, Jimmy Vestwood, American Hero, premiered in 2014 at the Austin Film Festival, where it won the Comedy Vanguard Award and the Audience Award. Jonathan has also taught writing comedy for film and television at Yale University. Our second guest is the Hebrew Hammer himself. Adam Goldberg is an actor that you've probably seen in quite a few films and television shows. You may know him best from the movie Saving Private Ryan, where he played Private Stanley Mellish. He's also appeared in films such as Dazed and Confused, Mr. Saturday Night, A Beautiful Mind, and television shows including Friends, The Jim Gaffigan Show, Entourage, and and he's currently starring in the NBC series Taken. We're really excited to welcome them to Judaism Unbound. I should say that we're recording this intro after we had the conversation with Jonathan and Adam, and our conversation was extremely fun, but also included a lot more colorful language than is typical for Judaism Unbound. So we've given it an explicit language label on iTunes, but we also suggest that uh, if you have little kids in the room, you might want to have this be one episode of Judaism Unbound that they don't listen to. If you find what they're doing really interesting, you can go search for the film, The Hebrew Hammer vs. Hitler on Indiegogo. There are a few more days in their equity fundraising campaign where people who give are actually going to be able to get equity in the movie. And then coming up will be some more traditional campaigns. We would be really excited if it turned out that somebody who found out about the film from listening to Judaism Unbound ended up uh, helping them put the film together in a larger way. So if that happens, please let us know. In the meantime, we are extremely excited to welcome Adam Goldberg and Jonathan Kesselman to Judaism Unbound. Welcome. Great to have you. Thank you. It's, it's wonderful to be Unbound. Well, Lex and I both did a rewatch of The Hebrew Hammer last night, so it's very fresh in our mind. We're excited to talk to you about the Hebrew Hammer 2 and and what uh, what you've got planned. But um, but before we get started, could you just kind of give us a little bit of the, the landscape, but particularly for our uh, listeners who who are not familiar with the Hebrew Hammer, if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, kind of what it was all about and also kind of when you made it, which was what I, I think about 15 years ago, what was the reason why you made it? What was the reaction? You know, whatever you think is important to sort of set the stage. All right, so in terms of making it, it started out as a, uh, uh, my second semester of film in, uh, in film school. It was a black and white, non-dialogue, five minute short. It kind of hit a nerve, like, you know, it was you know, it, the idea of a, a Jewish exploitation film started off as, as a joke, but I got my hands on every kind of a black exploitation film I could look at to sort of understand how the genre worked. And it was kind of interesting to me that black exploitation films at the time, what they would do are they're made by black filmmakers who are tired of the way they're being portrayed in cinema, like whether it's the Mammy character or like the hyper sexual or violent black man. And so they took those stereotypes, exaggerated them, but in the course of that movie, they would win. And it was a very empowering thing and they started a whole genre of films. And so, you know, the short kind of played with that a little bit. And then it kind of hit a nerve at SC when I was at film school at SC and people kept asking for copies of the VHS at the time, whether Dennis in Ohio or their parents, like all, you know, every Jew wanted a copy of this movie. 
So I was like, I should probably write this as a feature. And then, yeah, then it kind of took off. I wrote the feature and then an agent who, who knew a friend of, of mine's girlfriend saw the tape, called my number and said, this is really funny. And I'm like, I'm actually writing a feature of it. And then it was kind of off and running. And, you know, um, initially it was to do with a guy named Mark Platt, who uh, uh, was a big exec at Universal. Now he's a big producer. He produced um, La La Land recently. And it was made very clear to me that I wouldn't be able to direct it. And that was everything I'd ever done to that point was to direct. And, I, you know, it was also they didn't actually option the script, which is they didn't put money behind uh, the project to own it. And at the same time, this guy named Ed Pressman, who's a very legendary old school producer, reached out to me and basically called me in his office and said, you know, I'll let you make it, you can direct it, and I'll give you a million dollars to make the film. And that was it. And, uh, and then Adam came on board. So basically, I, you know, I had a list of like five people that I wanted. I, you know, the way I kind of reached out to people was like, you know, who's the coolest Jew, you know, like what, what, what Jewish actor sort of embodies cool <laughs> and Adam's name kept coming up. And then I, you know, I knew him, I knew of him, but I got really familiar with the stuff. And then at the same time, I'll let Adam take it over how Adam got involved. Adam. Yeah. Well, I just, I guess coincidentally, while not knowing any of that was occurring, I was having a meeting at Ed Pressman's company at content film. And, um, I was basically pitching them a film that I was going to direct, which I ended up directing the following year. Uh, Sophia, who was the executive um, on the on, on the Hebrew Hammer, said, "You know, you know, we have this thing. I think you might be interested in it." And she, you know, handed it to me. And, but I, but I believe I was reading it on the subway on the way home. And as soon as I got to the line, "Shabbat Shalom, motherfucker," uh, I was like, "Yeah." I might I might have even called her before I finished reading the script. I'm not sure when I got back to the apartment. And um, you know, I had had kind of misgivings. I mean, I've had these sorts of battles, you know, with myself and with my career and with the industry since I began acting, but I was not fully, I was a little wary of the idea of being identified with what could potentially be something that was kind of iconic or at least, you know, iconic in a kind of cult-like way. And, and that was so, uh, you know, that was so, so well Jewish basically. And, you know, as an actor, at least initially, my goal was to, to um, you know, to try and be as diverse as I possibly could in my roles. And certainly one can only be so diverse dependent on, on, on how, how it is, you know, they're, they're perceived and, and, and typecast and stereotyped and that sort of thing. So there was a part of me that always that felt like I was, you know, maybe going to like seal my fate forever, you know. And then another part of me just felt like someone else is going to do this part. And I don't want, and, and, and they shouldn't do it. <laughs> it was almost <laughs> born out of like this competitive feeling of like, I definitely should play that. So I, I kind of have to do it. It wasn't even like, it was, le- it was it wasn't even like I want to, which I did, but you know what I'm saying? It was like, I was like, I, I, I have to be this guy. I can't stand by and watch somebody else do this part. And um, so John and I met, we began to talk about, um, you know, some ideas I have and uh, had had and, and, uh, you know, we kind of collaborated a bit. And then, you know, I was involved in the casting process with, with uh, you know, with uh, the Esther role and Judy and all that kind of thing. But um, I actually had a question for John, which which I really never really asked. Because I always assumed, John, that you were into black exploitation anyway. But are you saying that sort of you reverse sort of engineered it where you kind of had this idea and then went back and, and, and looked at black exploitation stuff? That's exactly it. I had the idea for the short. And, uh, you know, I, I, and the idea came actually even before film school. I was everything always kind of starts with anger with me. I didn't get into film school the first time I applied. And so I started writing. Me neither. We're going to talk about that. Fuck oh. those people. I actually did a film my first, <laughs> my first semester called Regarding My USC Film School Application, which the, a, a version of me goes around and kills the entire, uh, you know, admissions faculty, whatever. Um, but anyway, oh my. Yeah. But anyway, so like I didn't get in. And so I, I started writing this idea about these two idiot film students. And one of them had this, uh, this, it started off when you first meet him, he has a short called Maccabee Rising, which was a, a Jewish exploitation film. And like a black guy in the class raises his hand. I was like, are the Jews necessarily exploited? And it was so that idea. And then when I had the idea for the short, I was like, you know what? I want to learn what this is all about. I even took a class <laughs> in black exploitation to kind of understand it. And especially because I knew that- Well, movie. actually, I, I have more questions for you. I feel like I should have asked these back then. I mean, I definitely immersed myself in the world of black exploitation was somewhat familiar with it back then. But I mean, I was into those movies anyway, but then I really got into them. But um, you had said that they, um, that, and, and, and that in those films, they, they sort of own the stereotypes, exa- exaggerate the stereotypes, own them, and then are obviously much more demonstrative and, 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 and uh, um, you know, more badass or whatever than, 
than um, the roles that they are, uh, these actors were uh, were accustomed to being cast in. So I guess my, is, is that, but was that really, it is what I've never been so, too super clear about with the black exploitation stuff. Are they really, own, I mean, is it really a conscious attempt to own the stereotype or was there a certain amount of them kind of acquiescing to the stereotype, but then well, I, I, my, being my, badass my, in, my, in addition my, to that? Like, is it that philosophically or, or, or yeah, is, no, is it that dogmatic? Yeah, I mean, so the, I, you know, in, in the class, I, in this class I was in graduate school, yeah, that was kind of it, at least, at least initially for the first, I think, five or six years of it, starting with you know, Melvin's movie, Sweet Sweet Back. Like, that was sort of the idea, you know, I mean, like, it, you know, like, so for example, a sweet back is like, you know, braised in a brothel and, you know, he's a super sexualized, violent guy and he's on the run and he ends up like fucking white women and killing the white man. But then I think five, right. years, five years into it, uh, you know, white Hollywood got sort of saw it that it was profitable and sort of started taking it and then it actually became exploitation in the sense that they were, they were jumping on someone else's train and the, the movies with themselves. Yeah, I know, but see, that's where the part I can't, that's the part I can't kind of reconcile. So in other words, when we call it black exploitation, is it because of the black? filmmakers were being exploited or because um um they were owning owning the exploitation i mean i i, 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 I think initially it was their owning exploitation and then i think once hollywood kind of you know white hollywood kind of got on board then obviously it took a different that that word took a different kind of uh, uh meaning i remember upsetting jews now it seems like we're upsetting like nazis but um in the beginning it seemed like we were maybe like upsetting jewish people because we were sort of like until they saw it. I think, until, I mean, I remember, you know, prior to us coming out when we were actually in pre-production, I don't know if you know this or not, but the ADL somehow got a, their hands on the script. And oh, yeah, I remember that. And they were like, it got, it got to the point, I was like, it was, I was already so stressed going into pre-production on this movie. It was like you know, a first big film for me. And, and having the ADL tell me that my film was anti-Semitic and they want me to cut eight things out of the script. Like, I'm getting notes from the ADL, which is like, fuck you. Like, seriously? <laughs> um, and, right. Uh, and then ultimately, after the movie came out, uh, I guess they had a conference of rabbis in Chicago who came to watch the movie, and they deemed that it was not anti-Semitic. And I was like, okay, great. I actually wanted to like hone in on that because I think that's what's one of the most powerful parts of your movie is that like I can't think of a Jewish stereotype that y'all didn't check the check the box. Like I'm thinking of like the Jewish mother. Yep, totally. Uh, money, pick up a penny. Yep, totally. Media conspiracy. Yep, global conspiracy. Like all of them, all of them are in there, and it's pretty wonderful. Like what? Like how did you go about doing that? And and I'm like obviously it was a proactive decision to like hyperbolically display these like you've talked about with black exploitation but what was the process there and like did you ever have any conversations with other with others involved in the film like where there was a line that you were worried about crossing or that you just said oh screw it and we're going to do it anyway actually i had one moment with adam mario at one moment with the guy who was going to play joseph lieberman who ended up, it was a, just a, like a, he was gonna, ed koch ended up taking that part as ed koch but i had it was going to be joseph lieberman initially and uh this guy was like i'm a, you know He's a, an actor who hadn't done anything. He's like, you know, am I gonna, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell on you. I don't know what that means. I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call the ADL or some of these groups. And I'm like, he's like, you know, unless I, unless I know this role will be helpful for my career. And I'm like, well, you'd be working with movie stars. I don't, I, I don't know. And he ended up just firing him. I was like, you know what? I can't. Like, I'm not dealing with like, a guy's got one line, like harassing me over the script. Um, there was a, a thing in which uh, Adam, Adam's character, Mario's character. There's, um, it was more of a black, uh, uh, like. Uh, I forgot what the scene was about, but it was like, there was, it was playing with black stereotypes and Mario and Adam felt it was offensive and we had a conference about it and I ended up cutting it and we, 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 we kind of rewrote it together. So yeah, certain things, we got, we got a lot of pushback. I think, that might, I think that might have been, yeah. Well, sometimes maybe you need to be reined in ever so slightly. Well, absolutely. And that's part of, that's part of the process. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, I, I'm, yeah. in my head, I'm writing exploitation. That's got to be, you know, I'm going to play with sex and, and profanity. And, you know, and the, one thing we didn't really do was like nudity and like, you know, they did in Sweetback because that just felt like for a comedy, that's a little. I know. Yeah, I know. We didn't do nudity. Why didn't we do nudity? Yes, I, I don't know. I, I think we should do more nudity, more, more skin. The eternal people. question. Yeah. Like, so I, I want to go back to, your, you know, like, it's funny because, you know, every time I write something, or and I'm sure Adam's the same way, it's like, you, you don't, you just get excited about an idea and you write it. But then it's, in hindsight, you kind of realize what it was about. And for me, uh, I was, you know, very culturally Jewish. Like my dad, you know, you know my, 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 we weren't religious Jews, but my dad had fought in the war for independence and I was very into being Jewish. But I was also kind of conflicted about it. You know, the fact that I wasn't religious and a lot of friends were, were conflicted about not being religious, but feeling Jewish and, you know, that sort of push pull and I think that's where the movie came from for me because I'm very proudly Jewish just not religious and I know in hindsight that's what it was for me in terms of why the idea kind of sparked me I have, I have one little thing that I that struck me 
much more this time that I watched the movie than when I initially did. And I, th- I think that you did something, maybe it was subconscious, maybe it was conscious with this idea of like what it means to be a real Jew or like an authentic Jew, because the, like little things that my favorite scene in the movie is when is when the hammer is like going to the JJL, the Jewish, uh, I forget what it's saying, like the, the league that is looking to save Hanukkah. And, and he has this, he has all these tests that he has to pass. And the first, and he has to like list off the six things on the Seder plate in alphabetical order. Um, he has to like, uh, what's the second one? There's the, oh yeah, he has to play like Hava on the high, on the violin. And then the third room is just empty. And the test is how much, how much you're going to fetch. And if you, if you what, like when you meet the threshold of enough whining, that's when you're allowed into the room. And I thought that was so beautiful, both because, you know, it poked at the stereotypes in the same way, but also because there's this real thing where like Jews are, are made to like know all sorts of background knowledge, like the things on the Seder plate or whatever to like be considered, you know, a real Jew or like feel that they are, that their voice is legitimate in Jewish conversations. And even, I mean, even with, even with y'all talking before, like, um, and other of our guests have said, like, uh, like, are you sure that we're going to be the best guests? We don't know that much about Judaism, all this stuff. I feel like there's something really poetic in the way that you, that you satirized that a little bit. And I'd love to hear like what went into that scene, if there was anything deeper or if it was just, you know, a cool artistic result. On, on, on the day it came up with the idea for, uh, um, you know, Buddhist, the dying and then Jewish basically being the scale from, from, <laughs> Oh yeah, we did. What yeah. was it? Be- That's so funny. What was it before? It was, it was just going to be like a UV meter, and that never because we had no art department money. It was just it was like okay, so we have like these three blocks. We have green, you know, <laughs> Buddhist, the dying, and the Jewish. Um, yeah, but again, I think it speaks to the playing with stereotypes. And John, we're funny. We should make a movie. <laughs> we're very funny. Which people should give us money to make a movie, Adam? I, I don't think it's that deep. I, in, 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 at least in my head, it's just sort of like again playing with stereotypes and you know, what it is to be Jewish. And then in terms of like, it's a rule of threes. It's comedies like you, like, you know, it's one of the rules is you know, that Duck Ravens came up with. Uh, you know, you want to get more and more ridiculous. And then, you know, it's just always twisting the joke, I guess. I yeah, I mean, I don't know. I can't have a deep answer for that one. There's a circumcision check. That's right. Yeah, there's, yeah, it's, it's uh, the, the Passover plate. It's rule of fours in this case. Look at that. I, I, I won up the rule of threes. So yeah, I, you broke the rules and, and oh. thereby creating an even funnier moment. I had an interesting experience in terms of my own sort of Jewish sort of growth or whatever. So, I, you know, the, the film went to the Jerusalem Film Festival back in, I think, 2004. And I went out and so my, you know, my dad's side, my dad, my dad broke away from me. He was raised Orthodox. You know, he fought in the war for independence. He came back and he just went to California. He, he stopped being religious. His, his half brothers are all settlers. And so the film was playing at the Cinema Tech in Israel, which is sort of the, the bastion or the center of left wing Israeli politics. I did not know any of this going in Israel. It was my first time in Israel. And then my, my Uncle Wally, who's now Uncle Zeb, shows up and he's got his yarmulke and his keep in his gun, like which is sort of like the uniform of settlers. And he kind of made a, a really big sort of uh, impression on people, so much so that the following night, there was a dinner for all the filmmakers and the woman who ran the festival, her name is Leah Von Leer, who's now deceased. She was like a, like a very sort of powerful woman in, his, in Israel society, I guess, at the time. She comes up to me, I don't know her, and she says, heard about your uncle. And, you know, we have a real problem with those people. And I said, well, well I said, Look, listen, I don't agree with his politics. I don't necessarily know what your politics are, but that's my dad's brother you're talking about. And it was one of those things mm-hmm. like, shit, the movie kind of, it is interesting. It, it does sort of, uh, I guess, whatever baggage you have going in can affect the way you sort of see that movie is sort of what I, what I kind of put from it, I guess. Maybe. I don't yeah. Know. yeah, no, no, that is, def- <clears throat> that, is, that is definitely true. Well, I mean, like that. I think that actually opens a, a question that I've been itching to ask you, and that you know, I think connects to actually this period that we're in in the podcast, where we've been exploring over the last few weeks and the weeks ahead, um, uh, what we call just regular Jews, right? People that are not, uh, they didn't go to rabbinical school, they didn't seek out to become Jewish professionals, but they're doing something really cool that's Jewish. And um, there's all all sorts of uh, projects going on, and uh, you know, I think this is one of them. And you know, one of the one of the things that we're sort of thinking about and trying to really raise up is this idea that, 
you know, there are sort of two visions of what Judaism is all about. You know, there's the vision that's that those who kind of say their rules and regulations say is the vision. And then there's the vision of, of Judaism that just regular people have. And they may not even be aware of one another. You know, I think it's often the other direction, right? The, the rabbis, uh, you know, the people that are kind of the rule makers don't imagine that the people actually have a different vision than they do. They just think that the people aren't aren't really following the rules, you know, and, and I'm interested in like how you think about like what you've done with the movies and sort of like, you know, this may be an overly, you know, sort of deep question for a comedy, but I, but on the other hand, I don't think it is, you know, that like, what is the sort of, what are, what are the things that you're trying to say and trying to think through in these movies? I think why a lot of Jews uh, uh, who are not religious find that, like, love the film and find it powerful is I don't give a fuck. I'm Jewish and I'm not religious and fuck you. Like that's, that's who I am. And that's sort of the attitude of the movie. I think people latch onto that. It's like, I own this, I own this Jewishness, and, but I, I don't, I'm not tied to the religion part of it. And in fact, going to that second part of the thing I was gonna say is, so my uncle Zev, after this had happened, you know, I was walking with him around the old city and he started going on to, he keeps giving me shit saying, you know, people like you or those people on, on the left, you know, like, like they're not really Jews. And I said, stop, I said, stop right there. I said, be glad that guys like me are owning Jewishness and, and, and being and, and claiming claiming Jewishness because like if, if you guys want to do this alone go for it because like you know like there's more of us to get like it was that kind of thing or like kind, kind of without us you guys are like a very small fringe and you're and, and be, be happy that lots of people who aren't religious identify with this, this culture and want to you know see it succeed and, and you know do positive look on the one hand I can understand about this I mean this is certainly what the white supremacists are talking about and ah oh, fuck I keep doing that where I keep equating the two and and, and, and I don't need to do that um but um, I'm just thinking about in terms of extremism and just how I've been, I feel like I've been sort of, there's this, been this cacophony of, of these totally bifurcated voices. Strangely, I mean, you say it's a heavy question for a film, you know, that is essentially just a complete and total slapstick comedy. But I have found that it has forced me to confront my definition of Jewishness um, in a sort of really uh, kind of, big way. I mean, it's had all kinds of crazy implications for me that just simply didn't exist before because I'm just in the throes of grappling with my identity in, 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 in a way that I really haven't since I was a kid in, 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 some, in some sense because I always felt like I was very, I had this very sort of nebulous, you know, identity culturally. I, I my mother was, you know, a last Catholic, uh, her, her parents are, you know, were German, Irish, French, Mexican descent, but basically, you know, it was like, you know, her parents were Catholic, you know, and, um, and uh, we had Christmas and we were very heavy, heavy, heavy into Christmas, you know, but then I went to a Jewish day school, which I think was actually, I think in my mother's idea more than it was my father's idea, who was an extremely secular Jew. And only over the years, my father started to, I mean, I would make this joke that it's like, instead of finding God, he's found, you know, he, it's like he's found Israel uh, as he gets older. Anyway, so I went to this Jewish day school, and that's a kind of really insulated atmosphere. And then I'm sort of done with it. You know, it's like I turn 12, and I go to, or 11, or whatever it was, when I graduate sixth grade, and I go to this progressive, uh, you know, sort of liberal arts secondary school. You know, and I just sort of, and I didn't have a bar mitzvah, because I felt like it was disingenuous, and that, you know, people just did it in order to earn money. Of course, a few years later, when it came time to buy my, my uh, first car, I totally regretted not having a performance. Mode. But, you know, and then I became, I became very interested in acting. And there was no stereotyping and typecasting when you're uh, acting in, in um, high school, or at least not for me. You know, I played Simon Simpson in our town. And, and then I started doing plays outside of school. And I played actually Joe Crowell, you know, the paper boy in, in, in our town. It wasn't really until I started kind of getting into the business, the business, film business itself, that I was sort of reminded again that like, oh, yeah, I'm Jewish or I'm perceived as Jewish or I'm perceived as a New York Jew or whatever. And I think at a certain point, I began to kind of like own the identity of this kind of neurotic New York Jew in a way because it was already happening to me. Like I was incredibly anxious, neurotic, stressed out person, um, which I really attributed if I wanted to sort of genetically attribute it to something, I, I attributed it much more to my mother's family rather than really the, the more kind of carefree and blase Jewish side of my family. So, I mean, so, so I, so that also planted the seed in my head, which was that I, it was important for me to fight these stereotypes and that kind of thing. And why for years it was hard for me to like, um, you know, sort of own the Jewishness, which was projected upon me, but then, which I also used in order to sort of give myself an identity. I mean, I began watching all these Woody Allen movies, but also Scorsese movies, and all these movies that took place in New York, 
and kind of, you know, sort of reimagined my childhood as taking place in this kind of like, you know, New York, you know, sort of Brooklyn kind of scenario. And um, having said all of that, it's like you go the other direction a little bit. Like you start to get typecast. People uh, have these incredibly, you know, simplistic perceptions of you and, and or you are outright uh, derided dealing with, you know, people who are, uh, I mean, I'm, you know, remember landing on an anti-Semitic website, you know, in the very early days in the internet. I mean, there was like three contemporary, you know, performers who were mentioned. It was like me, Sarah Silverman, and Jeff Goldblum. Um, <clears throat> and I was like, wow. And this is when websites were just like a page, you know? <laughs> so it's like, a, a, you know, there's all this kind of like pushback where it's like, no, you know, I, you know, I don't know how many fucking interviews in which I've talked about this idea of being half Jewish and being half Jewish and being half Jewish. I think even when I was promoting this film, I went on Jon Stewart and talked about being half Jewish. And Jon Stewart said something about like me being the most Jewish person he's ever met in his life. And, you know, it's like, and I was sort of, again, like fighting this idea that, um, and I think part of it is is just classic Jewish self-loathing, you know? And I think the other part of it was that um, somehow I felt like I was not being true. I was being, um, you know, I was like somehow disavowing this whole part of my life, which is my mother and my mother's side of side of the family. And it just felt like it was just too simplistic a way to view people just in terms of sort of racial and, and cultural uh, perceptions of them. But with everything that's gone on in the last 18 months or two years now or whatever with Trump and this incredible either rise of anti-Semitism or just the, you know, just the fucking, um, you know, the pothole cover just being sort of pulled off of all these sort of wretched fucking cockroaches or who are, you know, finally been, you know, given a voice and hitched their wagon at the Trump train. I suddenly felt like I was reclaiming my whatever, at least my, my gut sense that, that um, no matter how many, whatever percentage of Jewishness I am, however religious or not I am, and I'm not at all, um, that I am deeply offended in the very like core of my being in an ineffable way, in a way that I couldn't possibly put into words um, when I, um, you know, see this, you know, uh, anti-Semitic imagery, when I, when I, you know, you know, read about the, you know, the rise of of this, you know, sort of pop, you know, pseudo populism and, you know, and just thinly veiled, if not at all, Nazism. It's like, it's almost as though the disgust itself has become uh, my, my, my cultural identity. And, you know, it's like, it makes my relationship then with these other issues. I mean, I'm so interested to almost to, to hear what you guys have to say about it, because there seems to be this, like John is sort of saying, is in terms of Israel, you know, you're with us or you're against us. You're a real Jew. You're not a real Jew. And life is just so much more complicated than that. I mean, particularly if you're just not a fundamentalist person. I mean, if you're not a person who reads the Bible and believes it's a fucking history book. Yeah, it's a good segue, I think, although you both can tell me better. Um, just talking about anti-Semitism and all this, I feel like it's a good segue to start getting into the new project of Hebrew Hammer versus Hitler. And um, I'd love to hear from either or both of you just what's this movie about? I mean, other than that, the Hebrew Hammer will be back and that Hitler will somehow be confronted. And uh, how did how did the idea for this one come to be? I think all the time that's passed and the various iterations of the script and false starts and all this kind of thing, I swear to God, it just feels like it was all meant to be because it almost was irrespective of anything that was going on, like at least overtly in the cultural climate at the time. Whereas now it's like, no, now you really need, I mean, people have asked for this film without knowing that we had this film in the works. In the last two years, um, there's been this like, I mean, I, I say it in this video and one of these, you know, promotional videos that we that we've made, but that like on the one hand, my Twitter mentions were like, you know, to the oven with you, Jew. And the other uh, hand were all these people sort of saying, you know, we need the Hebrew hammer now more than ever without there being without me saying anything without without there having been any mention of the Hebrew hammer to or anything like that for a while. So it, it became like a. Uh, Important. Felt important. Well, you know, so it was almost like, pre and not prescient. I mean, obviously, it's always been around. I mean, you know, anti-Semitism isn't going anywhere, and it's always been there. But, um, but uh, it seemed like it just became a, a kind of uh, <laughs> this thing that we conceived in 2005 became really relevant, regardless of whether or not we recontextualize it to make it to sort of update it, which we did, but we barely even had to. Right. So it's like. 15 years later, and the Hebrew Hammer is now sort of, uh, he's now a consultant for the Jewish Justice League. He's no longer a crime fighter. There's a young upstart uh, crime fighter called the Semitic Jewish Man. 
or this doofus Brooklyn hipster who is like barely Jewish and um, for whatever reason, the chief has this operation, which is Operation Go Back in Time and Kill Adolf Hitler, which is a time travel mission. And they have a time sukkah. And so instead of sending the hammer, they send a Semitic Jewish man who is such a doofus, he gets captured by Hitler. Hitler gets an historian to basically tell him any time the Jews have ever done anything right, every time they've ever won or succeeded in, you know, in, in history. And Hitler starts going through time and re, 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 reworking history and kind of writing, trying to write the Jews out of the minority report. And uh, so the hammer, Muhammad Ali, Paul, Bill Rahim have to basically chase him through time and rewrite his wrongs. And, and we might be going to places like, um, you know, time of Moses and, and the slaves. And Israel, we might be going to see uh, Jesus. Well, yeah, because yeah, there might be some glitches with the time so far. Um, <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I, I, I've been describing it as a Bill and Ted, like if, 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 if you love Bill and Ted's uh, excellent adventure, but you didn't have patience for Shoah, then you'll love the Hebrew Hammer versus Hitler. I'm, I'm, I talk, we talked to him. See, I'm, I'm really curious though, about like what this seems like to just a sort of outside, you know, observer. Again, this this, this idea again of like secular Jewishness and what that means. I just kind of I don't know. I just I for, for, like that, that to me just is, is something I've just been so like it's to the point where like I started. I mean, I, I mentioned this to you before we started talking, but. You know, so I'm going to start, I think, I mean, I've set up about five different interviews with um, these anti-Semitic trolls who are, uh, you know, anywhere from being just like kind of, you know, goofy alt-right guys to uh, to just full-fledged, you know, self-proclaimed you know, Nazis, really. I mean, not, you know, that's literally what they call themselves. I, I find myself grappling with this idea of like, on the one hand, getting really deeply offended, for instance, when they say things like, like there was one guy on Instagram the other day who I who I just got to to sign up basically, and he's and it was a, we were promote uh, it was a promotional post for the Hebrew Hammer where I had uh, for the for the crowdsourcing campaign for for the new one and I put the Time Out New York cover that I was on the cover of way back when the film came out um, in the Instagram post and uh, the cover was Super Jews and it was the whole you know the whole issue was devoted to like whatever. I don't know, cool Jews or, you know, and, um, and so this guy was like, you know, it g- g- was all the usual tropes about, you know, can smell a nickel a mile away, like all the jokes that we already fucking make in the movie that, you know, is, is, is what their favorite thing to say to me is. Um, and, but then, uh, open borders for Israel, you know, gay marriage in Israel, blah, blah, blah. And I wrote back, I was like, Hey friend, um, instead of reporting you for this gobbledygook, I'd love to interview you. And, um, uh, and, uh, and also, you know, pro tip, uh, I'm not Israeli, like, like, <laughs> it's, it's, so it's, so it's like, I, I just, I, I just keep finding myself in this weird thing, like this kind of weird world of like being defensive about it, but then also wanting to defend, um, uh, like, you know, the, the, the defend the culture uh, of, of Judaism, but not be responsible for what, whatever. I mean, because again, these these criticisms range from everything from like what, what Israel is doing, which is ridiculous. I'm just a cap Jew born in Los Angeles. It's, I have nothing. To, what the <laughs> fuck do I have to do with that? Like, I I, I didn't want to make this podcast. That I'm doing uh, like a debate. I'm not going to debate these guys about the fucking protocols of Zion. I mean, but I want to be familiar with it. Do you know what I mean? And I realized like I didn't know anything really about all this shit. Like, so I, I bought like and it, funny funnily. Uh, there's not tons of books on the subject, but like, you know, bought a few books on like just the origins of anti-Semitism, you know, it's pretty fascinating, but it's also just like, Jesus Christ, it's just so, <laughs> it's, just, it's just, it's so fucking arcane. It's so anachronistic. It's all so insane, you know? Like that's again where I sort of bring it around to saying that like, right, one response to anti-Semitism is, you know, to be upset and afraid. Another response to it is to be powerful and fight against it. And the third response is to turn it into a joke, right? To make fun of it. Like, I think in many ways, like what you guys are doing is is all three of those. Um, and, and I think that like, it's important to understand that we have a Jewish tradition of all three of those. So, you know, you say, well, what's the right lesson to learn from the Holocaust? You know, is the right lesson that we should never let this happen to us again? Yes. Is the idea that we should um, never let this happen to anyone else? 
yes, that also, you know, is the idea that we should, you know, next time we should just sort of um, make fun of these losers. Yes. You know, right. So like, it's cool to see all that happening. And it's cool, actually, with the hammer, right, to actually be doing the the buffoonery, but also, you know, right, the 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 structure of it is with a superhero Jew, right? So I, I think it's really, it's really, there's there's something like interesting in, the, in your struggle, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. No, that, that, that's all actually really helpful. And, but yeah, no, I, I always kind of have to remind myself of that. I mean, partly because I just haven't seen the movie in such a long time, but that what to me works about that original film is that, <clears throat> is that, I mean, we keep using this sort of expression, take ownership, but what does that really mean? I mean, it's just, it's, you know, I mean, we're really saying, you know, look at how stupid this stuff is. So can we ask you a little bit about like how you're just how you're financing this film? Because I think it's really interesting. You know, why did you decide to go through this crowdfunding route? And number two, I guess, like, what are you discovering through it? I mean, you're also doing interesting things, right? This first round is like people can get equity in the film and then there's going to be another round. So a couple things like, you know, one, I, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but independent film is kind of on its on its, it's on the death sort of the, like a death gas or whatever. Like it's really hard to get in, to see indie films at this point. Like movies that are getting made right now are either like these big Marvel, you know, $200 million movies or like super mumble core kind of like half million to, to less budget films. Um, so Ab and I initially, we, we tried to go the, the traditional route. There's a lot of fans of the Hebrew Hammer, but no one's making these, like no one's financing these movies. It's hard to find money in independent film right now. And for the last two years, um, a guy named Mark Hofstadter, who runs film at Indiegogo, has sort of been reaching out saying, you should do something with us. Um, he's a fan. And, and so finally, uh, we sat down with him, me and Adam. He kind of presented this thing called equity crowdfunding, which is, that was about to happen. And now we're the third film ever to do this thing. And equity crowdfunding is, so it's like crowdfunding that you guys have seen, you know, kickstarting Indiegogo. But now people can actually have equity in the film. And this is only able to happen now because... Uh, Laws changed, I think, about a year and a half ago, something called the Jobs Act chain, where people can actually now invest in independent film, whether you're accredited or non-accredited investor. And so we went this route, and it's been great. We've, I mean, we've raised $111,000 to date. We have another a week plus on our campaign. But one of the things that Adam and I discovered along this, this way of doing this is that um, a lot of people, A, can't afford the $100 minimum investment. A lot of our fans want to give money to the movie, but can't afford that $100 minimum. And a lot of people don't feel comfortable um, giving information that's required to, to, to do this because it is an SEC, like, you know, Securities Exchange Commission kind of thing backed. So like they, you people are required to give their social security number and all their private information. So I literally have a spreadsheet of people who want to just give money to the movie, but can't. So we're going to be launching shortly a donation-based Indiegogo campaign. $111,000 is not just something to sneeze at. It's great. And it's cool that our fans can actually have ownership of the movie. So if it does well, they, they make a profit. But I think a lot of people just aren't prepared for this equity crowdfunding. So we're going to do a more traditional thing next. So and here, here's the ask again, like, you know, I mean, it, I, you know, the movie will be very, very funny. Like I, I, I think it's the best comedy I've ever written. Better, I think it's better than the first film. Um, but again, these movies are like films like this are not, are not getting made the, the, the way they used to get made. Like this is the way to do it. And so if you really want to, I mean, the movie's not there yet. Like we need help. Get, we have 110, but we need, it's a three, three, three million dollar movie. We need help getting it financed. So if you believe in this and, and you want to see something, first of all, it'll be a very, very funny movie, but also it's a very empowering movie and it's a very Jewish movie, even though it's also a mainstream movie. If you like this kind of comedy, like the first one, please help us get it made because we can't do it without fans or people listening or interested in the arts and that kind of, and that kind of thing. Can you give us some fun money? How's that? <laughs> so I think that's a pretty uh, poetic way to end this. So I'm just going to go ahead and thank the two of you. But uh, there's only one way to say thank you on a Friday when talking to the folks behind the Hebrew Hammer. And uh, so thanks, but also Shabbat Shalom, motherfuckers. Yeah, well, Shabbat Shalom, motherfuckers. Shabbat Shalom, motherfucker. And uh, we want to close out this episode in the same way that we always do by encouraging all of you out there to be in touch with us. And there are a few ways for you to do that. First, you can head to our Facebook page, Judaism Unbound. You can also hit up our website, JudaismUnbound.com. And last but not least, you can always hit us up via email at dan at judaismunbound.com and lex at judaismunbound.com. The last plug we like to make is that you can always support us financially with either a one-time gift or a monthly recurring donation. And you can do either of those at judaismunbound.com slash donate. One additional plug on the financial front is that you can, of course, support the Indiegogo campaign that is currently going on for the Hebrew Hammer versus Hitler. Help make it happen. As you've heard on this episode, it's going to be a really worthwhile project. And you can do that by just searching the Hebrew Hammer versus Hitler on Indiegogo uh, or just Google the Hebrew Hammer versus Hitler Indiegogo and it'll come up. So we'll include a link to that on our website as well. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. And with that, 
This has been Judaism Unbound.